Hey everybody, we're starting a brand new series this week on the book of James. And today we've got a special guest. He is the Frisco West campus pastor. His name is Aaron Frizzell, and I just know you are going to be blessed by his teaching. He and his wife, Reagan, they're just an incredible couple, some of the nicest, most authentic people you're ever going to meet. I know you're going to be blessed today, so would you join me in welcoming our campus pastor from Frisco West, Aaron Frizzell. All right. Morning, everybody. Thank you, Pastor John, for that greeting. I appreciate that. Hey, uh, let me just, first of all, before we start right here, let me say hi to all of our campuses uh, at McKinney. Good morning. Good to see you guys this morning. Glad you're here with us at Hope Fellowship. Those who are my people over at Frisco West and the team I get to lead beside, it's great to have you guys here today. Also, those who are watching online, such an honor to have you tune in with us today and uh, be with us here at Hope Fellowship. Obviously, for those who are right here at Frisco East, it's an honor to have you guys here this morning. I hope you had a wonderful 4th of July. I was a little disappointed that I didn't realize that there are so many bands on things to blow up that usually I grew up in Oklahoma for a lot of years and you could buy fireworks anywhere. In Texas, I have much more pride for Texas, all right? I'm just gonna say that right now. And I was kind of hoping I could blow something up and then I find out it's illegal to blow stuff up like everywhere. So... Uh, I hope you guys had a fourth, good 4th of July. Hey, full disclosure though, uh, before I jump in, I'm gonna tell you who I am, uh, a little bit more about my family in just a second as well, but I changed shirts today, and here's why. For your viewing pleasure, I had a brand new shirt on last night, and I realized when I get excited and talk about things like this, this area <laughs> looked very nervous. So I changed shirts for your viewing pleasure so that you didn't have to see my nerves, all right? But this is a great opportunity. I'm excited to be here. My wife, Reagan, and I have been on staff here for two and a half years, a little over two and a half years now. Uh, we get to serve as the campus pastors over at Frisco West. Like Pastor John said, we have three children. I have a 13-year-old son, Jackson. I have a eight-year-old daughter, Jada, and a two-year-old daughter, Ivy Grace all spread out in the various and wonderful stages of life. And there is no rhyme or reason as to why they were spread out that way. It was the heat of the moment, you guys, all right? Listen, don't go there, all right? Okay. Hey, I, I do wanna tell you, though, I'm excited about uh, the message today. Hopefully, you've enjoyed the series of talks that we came through and the story in the book of Jonah. If you wonder where Pastor John is at, he is taking a much-needed rest, and he's probably somewhere in the hill country on a motorcycle with the wind in his face. So just picture him with a big smile on his face, just having that wind blow through his face, all right? And I'm so glad that he's getting some rest. But great series of talks in the book of Jonah. This series of talks is right in the book of James. I'm gonna tackle chapter one. And um, the whole goal of this, obviously the, the word life hack, if you Google a life hack, like you saw in the video, it's taking something that was probably kind of common or something creative and going, hey, how do you do this faster? How do you do this more efficient? The book of James, is a great kind of life hack type of book. In fact, I would encourage you, if you have somebody in your life that's maybe new to faith, maybe you're new to faith, and you're like, man, what do I, what do I read that I can just immediately kind of put into my life and I can learn from, put into action, and see God present in that? The book of James is a great book. I wanna walk you through over the next five weeks, here's what we're gonna be talking about. Chapter one, the believer in temptation. Chapter two, faith and works. Chapter three, the tongue and wisdom. Chapter four, pride and humility. And chapter five, patience and prayer. Obviously all of these things, I'm, I'm looking at these in my own life and thinking, I need help with every single one of these. So hopefully if we, as we go throughout these next five weeks, you're gonna have something, you're gonna walk away and go, all right, that's good. I needed to have that as a reminder. Let me give you a few things just kind of from a teaching perspective on the history of the book of James. Uh, the book of James, according to what our research shows, was written around 49 AD. Two super important events happened prior to writing in the book of James and after writing the book of James. One prior to was the creating of what's called the Jerusalem Council. Jerusalem Council was created because, kind of like in our culture, a lot of times when people come from outside of the way we were brought up, 
when we bring them into our setting of Christianity, we usually have these kind of rules that we just assume everybody knows about, right? So when you come into church, it's like, we just, let's take a simple thing. We assume like, hey, during worship, if there's a clappy song, we clap, all right? I grew up in a hand-raising church, so there was the assumption of like, hey, when it gets really exciting, we all just raise our hands, okay? Those are just the things we assume, but there was deeper issues that the Jerusalem Council had to tackle, and one of them was if the whole faith in Jesus was a Jewish thing, all of a sudden Gentiles got involved and they brought all of the way they saw religion into it. So the council said, how do we bring some peace between them? Following the book of James, there was around, I think they say around 70 AD, which is the after death of Jesus Christ, uh, was the destruction of the temple. So let's take this right here, this building, being a present day kind of example of a temple, if this thing was destroyed, this represents to us a connection between the presence of God and our faith. So our, our faith and our, and our connection with God in, the, in those times, when the temple was destroyed, it created a lot of doubt. So James wrote this recognizing there was these questions that people had about their faith. So the goal of James, let me put this up here to kind of give you like what's, what's the whole goal of what James is written for, was practical spiritual advice to be given and to build harmony between, like we said earlier, Jewish and Gentile Christians in the first century and for future readers, which obviously is us. So this is a book that he wrote to say, hey, uh, I think this is gonna be some super important stuff. I think that you need to put this into practice. And if you put this into practice, I promise you it's gonna change some things in your life. Let me put a key scripture out of chapter one that I think is important for us to know. James chapter one, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Um, let's put that in modern day language for just a second though and just say this. I have heard this a thousand times. I probably said it a thousand more. Actions speak louder than words, right? He was noticing that as people were gathering together, there was this idea of because the law was the rule and now Jesus introduced grace, people were thinking, well, yeah, I can speak the language well. I can tell you what the law is. I can tell you what the important parts of, of, of the Torah are and I can, I can quote those, but then they walk out and they live something totally different. How do they act? How do they talk? What do they eat? What do they drink? All those types of things. There's a quote that uh, one of my favorite authors, his name is Brendan Manning, said, and it helped me wrestle with this. My, the way my family raised me was to think this way. Every time, outside of just talking to character and integrity, every time I'm somewhere when I am by myself or if I'm with a group of people, just picture if Jesus is in the room, what would I do? What would I say? How would I act? That was my kind of parameter of knowing. So here's what Brennan Manning says. He says, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him with their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. I've been a pastor so my entire life. Okay, this, this, word, this quote right here would define what you've probably heard a thousand times if you've grown up in the church, I've heard it a billion times, all right? I also like to exaggerate if you didn't know that. All right, I just wanted to point that out there, all right? Hypocrite, right? We've heard that so many times. I call them real people because I'm one too. I have had times where I've walked out of the door and lived something out, said something different, treated somebody a certain way. But what they found, the reason this book is so good and so practical is because this is one of the greatest battles that they were facing is how do we get people who were not raised around this Jewish culture, that they are hearing about the grace that Jesus offers, how do we take that and put them together and merge and create some peace, okay? Um, let's talk about James for just a second. This is important to know because James was actually the half-brother of Jesus, all right? I'll make sense of this in just a minute. He was the half-brother of Jesus. So he saw him raised in flesh and blood form. If there's anybody, all right, if, you're, if your sister or your brother became some big shot person and they, and they were, they were the, the one that everybody looked to for wisdom, if you were raised around them, you'd be the person going, oh yeah, let me tell you some stories about this, about this guy. He's not what you think. Like, okay, he's smart, I admit. He memorized a lot of the Jewish culture and all the stuff, but he could have played the skeptic. But here's the thing I want you to know. 
James knew him as the man Jesus, flesh and blood. But over time, he discovered him as the son of God. He discovered him as a savior. He went from a travel agent of faith to a tour guide of faith. So many of us live in this way too. What does a travel agent do? Travel agent sits down with you and goes, where would you like to go? I'd like to go to Fiji. Ooh, what a beautiful place. Let me tell you all about it. Show you pictures on the computer. Here's how much it costs. Here's a great uh, hotel to stay in. Here's a great beach you can visit. Oh, that's awesome. But if you look at them and go, hey, what was your experience? Most travel agents are gonna go, oh, I've never been there. I can't, I can't even afford to do that. But I would like for you to afford that so that you can pay me, okay? But a tour guide is someone that goes, oh, you wanna go there? Oh, let me tell you something. There's this one there's this one area on the beach that has this mountain. If you walk up, now let me just warn you, you gotta make sure you stay hydrated because about halfway up this mountain, man, I'm telling you, the elevation, it'll mess you up. If you don't have, do you have a certain type of shoes? Oh, you gotta make sure and get the certain type of shoes. But once you get to this one cliff, oh, there's this place that's the perfect place to take a picture. And I think James, when you read this book, think of it through that lens. This is a guy that was walking through going, oh, oh, you wanna know about Jesus? Well, what do you wanna know about Jesus? What do you wanna know about faith? Oh, let me tell you about that. Okay, let me, let, me, let me walk you through what you're asking about right now because I saw it from an up close and personal perspective. I watched him die on the cross. I watched him be raised. I walked with this guy. So when he's talking, he's talking with an authority of knowing I could have played the skeptic, but I'm a believer too. I'm a believer too. And this, this gives us this lens of what it is to, uh, to, to read this book, okay? I wanna, I wanna give you a perspective on, um, let's take the word wisdom, right? Wisdom comes from experience in life. But when I say to somebody, or when you say to somebody, well, what would be godly wisdom when it comes to this area of life? Most of the time people look and go, oh, great, you're gonna tell me what's right and what's wrong, what your opinion is versus what my opinion is. This is what I think about godly wisdom that comes from experience. Godly wisdom tests the intentions of my heart. It's not saying, uh, let's, let's take something, Pastor John, we talk about this a lot, a lot of times, a marriage and alcohol. It seems like those are the two things that we deal with a lot, especially in this area. It's not saying right, wrong, drink, don't drink. It's saying, here, question. What's the intentions of your heart? What are you putting first in life? What's the most important thing that you go to whenever you have a difficult time in your life? What is your, what is your tendency in marriage? Is your tendency to run? What would godly wisdom say when it comes to marriage? So I think wisdom, if we take this from a perspective of godly wisdom, James has a lot of godly wisdom for us. James has a lot of godly wisdom for us. But I also think this, that you cannot give away what you do not have. This is where I go back to the travel agent versus tour guide. If you have someone that comes to you and say, explain your faith to me. Why do you believe in Jesus Christ? If you have not walked through, if I have not walked through to go, oh, oh, let me tell you about, not, 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 the, not the experience of church. Let me tell you about the person, Jesus, that I discovered, that I fell in love with. Let me explain grace to you. Let me tell you what changed my life. Not what I walked in and thought, man, I, I think I got my Sunday clothes on today. I feel good. I clapped on beat. I laughed at the pastor's jokes. I greeted a few people. I even volunteered. Like every one of those things are fantastic parts of walking into the experience. But James is saying, no, 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 no. Let's go deeper. What took me from skeptic to believing that he really was my savior? First thought I wanna give you out of, out of James is simply this. Life has tough seasons, but passes, and we can learn from it. Again, practical wisdom. You're not gonna walk away and go, ooh, that really blew my mind, okay? This is good, just life hack stuff, all right? Let me read you starting with verse two. Here's what it says. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Let's say that with furrowed eyebrows. What? That's, that's not, that doesn't make sense. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will, be you will be perfect 
and complete, needing nothing. I wanna have a place in my life where I'm needing nothing. If you need wisdom, I love this, ask generous, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith in, is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. I've been there. We've probably all been there. I wanna tell you a quick story because I wanna tell you kinda of how I apply this to my life. We have three kids, like I told you. We have a two-year-old right now that two, actually she's about two and a half. Two and a half years ago, when I found out we were pregnant, I guess a little bit more than that, three years ago, because there is a nine-month period right there, all right? Uh, when I found out, super pumped. Totally gonna be honest though. There was a little part of me that was like, oh man, I'm not really looking forward to the first few months. Okay, now I know all the moms out there that had babies are going, oh, there's certain things you didn't look forward to in the first few months, like, like childbirthing, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, it was probably really rough on you, wasn't it? Okay, I get it, moms, bear with me. I'm just trying to be honest for all the dads out there. Exhaustion. The first few months when you get no sleep and you're delirious and you drink way more caffeine that is, than is healthy, you know what I didn't look forward to? The season trying to get rid of the pacifier. When it's 1 a.m. and you've lost the 87th passy and you're like, now's the time to let it go. But when it's 1 a.m. and there's a Walmart a mile and a half from you, you get up at 1 a.m. and you buy the family pack. <laughs> and you come back and go, after these are gone, then I'll get rid of the pacifier. Diapers, for the love of Pete, diapers and formula, after you get rid of that season, you get a raise. <laughs> the gas reducing formula is like $59 a can. You know, I mean, I couldn't wait. But here's the thing, because of wisdom and life experience, I knew a little piece of life, and that is the seasonal pass. The seasonal pass. Life gets, gets really super tough and messy sometimes. You're sitting here this morning, you're like, okay, Aaron, that's cute, but I don't have kids. Maybe you're married in this house though. And you're in the middle of a tension and you think this season's never gonna end. We argue about everything. We are not on the same page on anything. Every one of our desires, they, they, this is not what I want. This is not what I signed up for. The for better, for worse, this is just for worse. But I promise you, the season will pass. Allow God to be the center of it. The season will pass. It will get better. You're in the middle of a job and you think, I hate my job. I can't stand my boss. I can't stand my coworkers. I don't like how far the commute is. I wish I had a different job. I don't even wanna do the thing I'm doing right now. I want a different career. I promise you, the season will pass. Here's the other part of it though. If you look at it through the lens of what James just told us, the external's not the issue. It's what God's trying to fix on the inside. This is where grace comes in. I want my boss to be nicer, so niceness. I want my coworkers to be more pleasant, so pleasantries to them. Begin to sow into the season around you. Well, I have this kid, I can't, oh man. I'm gonna have to iron fist some discipline on this kid because I can't figure out how to get, show some grace. If you want grace, show some grace. Release some grace. The season will come to an end. We'll look back and it will look back at how we treated or how we talked or how we did and we'll look back either with regret or to say, you know what? James is right, there is a reward on the other side of this because who I'm becoming is greater than who I am in this present moment. There's a, there's a statement that we say here um, all the time. Before I say that, I, I almost skipped a my notes here. Let me just say this to you real quick. Let me put this on the screen. My mentor said this years ago. Her name is Jeannie Mayo. Persistence is the greatest revenge you can ever pay to hell. I wanna, I wanna, I wanna bank in here for just a second. Listen, the only, the only thing that the enemy has on you and I is Patience. He can wait till you have the greatest influence in your job. He can wait till he has 
till, till you have uh, the biggest platform you've ever had in your life. You can wait till you, has, you, you have the, be- the biggest amount of money in your bank account and then take you down. Why? Because he banks on the fact that eventually he can wear us down because we lean too much on ourselves instead of leaning on who God is. Let me just say this to you. In your marriage, be persistent in believing that God can fix it. In your children, be persistent in believing that God can save them. In your job, be persistent in believing that you can be the change agent that you're looking for. Don't look for somebody else to be that change agent. Be be persistent about the fact that when you want to give up, keep coming. Sunday after Sunday, Saturday after Saturday, weekend after weekend, come, come here to the house of worship. Worship when you don't feel like worshiping. Pray when you don't feel like praying. Why? Persistence is the greatest revenge because it is what we pay to hell. The enemy walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but here's the cool thing though. When we feel like we're gonna be the ones devoured, it's in our weaknesses we lean into it and God says his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Persistence is the greatest revenge we can ever pay to hell. There's a a statement we say around here all the time, a cultural statement to our staff, and this is what it is. Choose your lens. Because here's what I believe. My perspective of the season I'm in greatly determines how I'll walk through it. My perspective not your perspective of my season. Now, I'm just gonna be honest with you. I sometimes will take other people's perspective of the season I'm in, and I'm like, oh, maybe you are right about that. And it changes my perspective. If you were to lay in front of me uh, positive and negative glasses, and if I put them on, if I put on the positive ones, it's like all of a sudden I could see something great. Now, I'm not talking eternal optimism. Okay, I am hardwired, I am an eternal optimist. I can look in the worst situation and there's something about the wiring of my brain that I go, oh yeah, but there is some good in that thing over there, you know? There's some good in that person. There was a guy that told me that I used to work with years ago, he goes, dude, you would see potential in Satan. That's probably true. I mean, God could save Satan too, right? I mean, he did, he created him and he threw him out of heaven, okay? But here's the deal. What I'm saying is in your life, There is a moment where you have to go, I gotta take these nasty, ugly, negative lenses off and I gotta put on the ones that say God's perspective and I gotta look through these lenses and go, okay, wait a second, wait a second. Where is God present in my current challenge? Where where is God present in my current circumstance? Where is God present in my current marriage? Where is God present in my children's lives? Where is God present in my job circumstance? We are presently living in the home, renting the home of a man who is absolutely incredible. And he's experienced more tragedy than I can ever imagine. But he chooses a lens every day that blows my mind. His amount of loss that he's walked through. But yet every day he wakes up and says, whoop, God's redefining my life today. God's redefining my life today. God's redefining my life today. And he's chasing something that God has put on his life. I challenge you today, choose your lens. Choose the lens to see God present where you feel like he's absent. Second thought I want to challenge us with today is don't fear temptation, but fight sin. Don't fear temptation, but fight sin. Here, here's the truth about temptation. Temptation's always present because we, we live in a sinful world, right? Since the day that Adam and Eve screwed it all up for us, okay, <laughs> we have sin, we have temptation, Temptation has, yes, it has a power over the way we think, the way we process stuff. But I wanna, I wanna give you some thoughts for just a second to, to kind of think through what is the power of temptation. I, I, wanna, I wanna share a personal story with you because when I get prepared for speaking anytime in front of anybody publicly, I get PMS. Pre-message syndrome. All right, and all the ladies and I was like, what is he saying right now? Okay, my family knows it. I have pre-message syndrome. I get super antsy. I, get, I, I, I process all these thoughts. I'm thinking, man, I'm gonna stand in front of a whole bunch of people and I don't wanna look like an idiot. I wanna know what I'm saying. Okay, here's what it really boils down to though. When I dig into God's word and I'm gonna share it with somebody, you know what the Holy Spirit does with me? Challenges me with it before I talk to anybody. It goes back to I can't give away what I don't have, right? And what I find out is the more I dig into temptation, it makes me wrestle with my own temptation. The more I dig into my own circumstances and go, okay, before I stand in front of people and say, hey, find some great things in the current situation that you're in, it makes me look at the areas that are challenging in my, my current circumstances and go, 
okay, am I, am I asking myself where God is present in that though? And it, it, it agitates something inside of me. Here's the thing I want you to know. Wherever God is calling you to be, that is probably gonna be the most agitated part of your life because he wants to present you as someone who can say on the other side of it, no, let me tour guide you through to this freedom part. This is why I love regeneration and re-engage and you watch and listen to these stories because they come into it as a, as a travel agent and go, yeah, I've heard that there's great marriages out there. But then they come out of the program and they're like, oh man, if you've never been through this, you gotta walk through this. You're gonna love who you are with your spouse on the other side of this. I noticed when I was in student ministry, we've spent about 15 years in student ministry. Man, when if it was, if it was the series on lust, it was like that during that period of time, it was like my eyes would wonder, my temptation was on heightened, and I was thinking, man, I'm trying to help people work through this. What in the world? Well, it's because I put attention to it. Whatever I focus on, was fueled. And let me just say to you, wherever you're focusing on that God is trying to set you free from, that is the area the enemy will put a big, huge target on your life. But temptation, temptation is not really the biggest issue. This is why it says, don't, don't blame temptation on God. Let's figure out where the blame needs to go. Let me give you a couple of thoughts when it comes to temptation. Temptation is only as strong as our lack of trusting that God has given us a way out. We, we know this to be true, okay? There's nothing that we're gonna face that we have not been given some way out. Let's take a 17-year-old kid, their junior year, they're invited to a party, and they come home, say they made a mistake. Maybe they, maybe they drank some, maybe they, whatever it happens to be, okay? And in your family, you're thinking, oh man, this is, this is the end all, right? But they come home and they say this, ah, I don't know, I just, I kind of got stuck. I just didn't know where to go. As a parent, what do you think? I could tell you 3,200 ways you could have got out of that, okay? You could have called me. You could have said, hey, my parents are lame. I have to go home, <laughs> sorry. You could have, you know, called a friend, you know, phone a neighbor, walk out of the house and walk down. The, I mean, you could think of so many things, but we do the same thing with God, right? We get in over our head with debt, but God, if I drive this kind of car, people think I'm more successful. I had to buy it. I know it was 70 grand, right? But I mean, but, but I leased it, okay? But you still can't pay your bills, right? I know, I mean, listen, I know, I know you're not supposed to have lunch with people of the opposite sex, but it was a business deal. And all of a sudden now you're caught in a situation, you're going, but now I wanna have lunch with this person, right? And God has given us a way out. So what do we do? We blame God and go, you know what, God, I can't believe you put me in a job where I have to have lunches and do business deals with people of the opposite sex. And God's like, I didn't do that to you. No, you could have called your wife and, and, and said that, yeah right? We, God has a way out. Here's the other part about temptation though. This is the, this is the part that it, it hits all of us right here. Temptation to sin is not the, really the big issue. It is our weakness that we don't want to address. Ugh, got shot. Temptation. It's not walking down the mall and me having to teach my son, okay, bounce your eyes, bounce your eyes. Oh, I have to do it all the time, right? You walk by, what is it? It's Victoria's Secret over here, and I'm like, Jackson, look the other way. Jackson, look the other way. Jackson, look the other way, okay? But then you look the other way, and there's some other story. I look like the other way. Okay, just close your eyes and walk down the mall. I don't know what to tell you, all right? But it's not really, it's not, it's not just saying, oh, well, it's, it's what this, uh, it's the culture we live in. No, no, it's not the culture we live in. It's my own weakness, it's my own weakness. It's me looking at my own life and saying, okay, this is where I struggle. And until I come to a place to say, God, I gotta give you the area I struggle in most. And I need your healing in this area. Until I'm willing to do that, temptation seems to be the thing that I like to blame it on. Last thought here is simply this. Work toward applying God's word and not simply absorbing God's word. I looked at this word a lot because here's what I think. I think we have too many people that are uh, Google theologians. Well, I looked it up and I think it says this. And it's like, oh, that's cool. Have you walked that out? 
Well, no, but I think it says this. Well, that's cool, because you're seven, okay? <laughs> and I know that you have Google, but it doesn't mean that that's what God's word really actually means. But here's the thing, I think in our culture, though, a lot of times we go, well, we know better than what God's word says because we have this other Google version of it. I think that when James was ch- saying this, he was saying, hey, let's, let's not just walk out and just say, well, I, 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 got a, I got a scripture to quote, so now every time I have a temptation, I'm gonna quote this scripture. Why don't we figure out how to walk that out, really wrestle with what grinds against us? I believe that the moment that we do that, it gives us permission to allow allow God to really make a change. I would say field test it. Put it into action. Walk out of here today and go, let's figure out if this is really true. Let's figure out if that preacher got up there, that campus pastor really was true when he said all this stuff. I think that 2 Corinthians, this scripture right here says something so good. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, thank you, God, then I am strong. Why? Because it's Christ's strength inside of me. I wanna give you a story, and then I'm gonna give you three life hacks, and we'll, we'll let you guys go. There's a story I heard of a young man who had a dream, and in the dream, there was three people standing in front of him that were all praying, all of them praying super intently, super intently. The first one He walks over to him, Jesus is standing in front of him, and as he is praying intently, Jesus walks up to him, gives him a huge embrace, puts his his face cheek to cheek with him, and says, I love you, I love you, I love you, over and over and over. He walks away from that young man, he goes to the next person, he doesn't embrace him, but he puts his arm on him and says, I love you, whispers to him. Then he walks away. Jesus walks to the next person, and the last person, he just stood there and watched him. Guy's praying just with as much intensity as the first two. And then all of a sudden he wakes up from the dream and the guy goes, oh God, I wanna be like the first person. I wanna be like this one. And the Holy Spirit speaks to him and says, what do you mean? Why do you wanna be like that first person? Oh, I wanna feel you embrace all the time. I wanna hear your voice all the time. And he goes, well, let me teach you something about what I showed you in this dream and here's what it is. First person's brand new to faith, and if I don't embrace them, if I don't talk to them, if I don't communicate to them, they're gonna have a difficult time hanging on to the fact that I'm really present in their life. Second person is a little bit further down the the road in their faith, and man, all I gotta do is touch them, occasionally speak to them, and they're good. Third person, though, they feel tested everything about me, and they know it's true. And regardless of if I speak to them, or regardless of if I touch them, they're gonna walk with me the rest of their life. Now, now listen to me for just a second because I'm not saying that we, we should try to just go in successive order because I think there's seasons of life we go back to this. There's seasons of life we go back to childlike faith in an area of our lives. But I think as we walk through it, here's what I want you to know. Sometimes when you feel God the least, you are pleasing him the most. Sometimes when you feel God the least, but still walking out the truth of his word, you are pleasing him the most. Why? Because if we go back to the day that he died on the cross, he was buried and three days later he rose. That miracle in itself is enough to keep us knowing. Even though I didn't get to be there on that event, I have watched thousands of people believe in this truth. And because of that, I'm gonna choose to say, you're still real, your wisdom's still true, and I promise I can bank on it. Let me give you three life hacks I'm gonna let you guys go today. Number one, determine today what way your faith will lean and sell out to it. Sell out to it. Just wake up tomorrow morning and go, you know what? I'm all in, God, whatever that happens to be. Whatever you ask me to do, I'm just saying, be present in my life today. Number two, focus on the good gifts that God has given you even in difficult seasons. Every one of us in this room, no matter what age or season of life you're in, you have a difficult season Find good, good gifts. Find the perfect gifts that God gives us. The last one, determine to put what you know about Jesus into action and see what the outcome is. Test these things. And just like James did, go from just being a travel agent talking about this whole Jesus thing. Become a tour guide and take somebody by the hand and go, let me walk you to the Jesus that I know. Let me walk you to the person that sometimes I don't feel him, sometimes I don't hear him, but gosh, I know he's present in my life and he can be present in your life too. I believe that what James walked out being the brother of Jesus, knowing him as a man, but discovering him as a savior, it's the same thing you to do too. You can know him as the guy that your pastor talks about, but discover him as the person 
that walks with you day by day by day by day. Can I pray over you today? Jesus, thank you for your word. And God, in just a second, we're gonna have pastors that are gonna come up here and give us a chance to put in action the things that we've heard. I pray your grace would walk with us today. When we face temptation of all kinds, God, and your word says that we're gonna face them. You said it in the beginning of this chapter. We're gonna face a bunch of junk, but there's something you wanna do inside of us. And that what you do inside of us builds a trust inside of us to know that you're present. God, help us to know that you're present today. God, for those who are in this room who need to, to feel you and hear you, I pray that you would be that present in their life. And as they grow in their faith, God, the times when they feel you and hear you least, God, may they be pleasing your heart the most. I thank you for your grace in our lives today. Thank you for James writing this book and helping teach us today in modern day. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen.